this evening with an introduction to the book of 1st John. Who is the author of 1st John and what are some reasons maybe I know there's an outline but see if see if you have some reasons your own or use the outline. Why do we call this 1st John? And who wrote it? No, oh, any evidence. Oh, well, most of the early Christian writers all claimed it for John. Okay. Um, but then internally, there's a, he wrote, there's a lot of similarities between this and the Gospel of John. Sure. His writing. Sure. Does John ever identify himself in most of the works that carry his name. No, he doesn't. The book of Revelation is an exception, uh, but that's not the revelation of John. Most Bibles have it as the revelation of Jesus Christ to the seven churches who are in Asia. But it was revealed to John, but in the books of John, the Gospel of John, in the books of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, we do not get a usual entrance into the book. With the, apostle, with the epistles of Paul, how do those books usually begin? From the apostle's name. Sure. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Something along those lines, usually. The Gospels themselves... They, the Gospels themselves don't usually identify who wrote them either. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all start differently, but they don't identify the author. Neither does the book of Acts. But in this section of scriptures, we do have, for the most part, identification. There are exceptions. The book of Hebrews doesn't start that way. Uh, the book of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John doesn't start that way. But... In the epistles, I think that's the only ones that don't start that way. I know James starts with yeah, Peter and 1 Peter. Let's see what 2 Peter has. Uh, Simon, Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ. So we usually have that starting. So as soon as we don't have a name, we have to come up with our best guess as to who wrote it. Now, we're coming at it from a 21st century perspective. We are 20 centuries removed from when this book was written. And so, as Bill had said, there's external evidence, and then there's internal evidence. External evidence is evidence that's not inspired comes from people who maybe commented on the book of 1 John. Some people might have actually lived in the time period of John. That's how we know the book of Matthew was written by Matthew. Because the people in the first century called it the Gospel of Matthew. Same with Mark and Luke and John. Well, I don't read the Church Fathers. I have them in my Bible program. I think I have referenced them once in my six years of preaching here. And that was only because the person who was corresponding back and forth with me was using them. And so I had to know a little bit about what they said. They're basically big commentaries. But some of them are from early, early, early 2nd century. 
and some of them are a few centuries removed, but they're closer than we are. And so church, the so-called church fathers, like Polycarp and Pius and Arrhenius and Origen and Cyprian and Clement of Alexandria and Tertullian and Eusebius, all attribute the book of 1 John to the Apostle John. Now, they're not inspired, so does their word definitive? No, it is not definitive. It doesn't prove that it's the but this written by John. But if I lived at this time and I said, well, this history book here was written by X, Y, or Z, and someone thousand years later found an ancient copy of this book, but the front cover was missing. But they also found me referring to it as the, written by such and such an author. They would come along and say, well, we can't guarantee that it was, but if authors at that time, especially not just one author, if more than one and a multitude of them refer to an author of a book as this author, we can be fairly certain. But much more powerful evidence is found in the gospel itself. And when you compare it, maybe, to the book of John, which we are fairly certain was written by John, just how John phrases himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved, and some of the accounts that he gives in there, it would fit with being John. You guys have listened to my preaching for six years now. Uh, over, just over, exactly six years. I was here, started on the first Sunday in September 2014. Hard to believe that it's been six years, but it has. You know, when I preach on a certain topic, how I talk. I know how Bill talks about certain things. I've heard him preach many times. And I know how Bill speaks about the topics that he speaks about and I generally know where he's going to be coming from, and you know where I'm going to be coming from if I deal about the deity of Jesus, the foreknowledge of God, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because we're all, we all speak the same way concerning our speech. Bill doesn't sound like me, and neither does Henry. I'm not talking about their voice. I'm talking about their language that they use. We all have a different vocabulary. Some, some have a very higher vocabulary, some not so high. I try not to be as high in my vocabulary. I'm not uneducated, but I try not to be as high. So there's always those differences when you have speakers. Ones will sound very educated, then some will not. Some use different types of words to express the same thought. Others use different words to express the same thought. But you usually can tell. When you read the writing of someone, if you have tons of their writing, you can see, okay, they like this phrase over this phrase. They'll use those things. There are distinctive phrases in the book of John versus the book of 1 John. We find words like beginning used a lot. Light used a lot. Love and abide. Those are all words, yes, the other authors of the New Testament will use them. But John especially. How does the book of John begin? The Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. Naomi, read 1 John 1 verse 1. That which was from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the Word of life. Notice. We have that which was from the beginning. We even have the word of life in that passage. The first section of the Gospel of John talks about in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. And the word was God and the word became flesh. You could almost summarize the, fir the first half of the chapter of the Gospel of John in these first three verses of the epistle of 1 John here. 
He starts it the same way. There are other phrases that we see. Henry, you want to get 1 John 1, verse 6, and Bill, John 3, 21. If we say that we have a fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Okay. John 3, 21. Um, but he that doeth the truth cometh to the light, that his works may be made manifest, that they have been wrought in God. Okay. We're talking about doing the truth here. Now, different versions are going to... Uh, if we're all reading from the same version, you might see that a little clearer, but Bill and Henry's version both had the truth. Henry referred to darkness. We, if we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not do the truth. Bill's, Bill's verse takes it from the opposite side. But it's still talking about light and truth. Uh, Tammy, you want to get 1 John 3 verse 2? Naomi can get John 11, verse 52. 1 John 3, verse 2. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Okay, and John 11, 52. And not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. Okay. Children of God is not one of those ones where we're necessarily going to be able to say, but Paul usually refers to children of God as how. He doesn't usually refer to them as children of God. He, it's of God, but something has replaced children. If you have a male child, he is your... Son. Remember Galatians 3.26, we are all sons of God. We are all sons of God. He usually, usually Paul deals with uh, sons of God. He does use children of God. But usually Paul says, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And so usually you can spot Paul referring to sons of God. And John referring to my little children, children of God. And, and so both saying the same thing. But again, word usage. Uh, uh, Henry, you and I get John 3 verse 9. Sorry, 1 John 3 verse 9. And Bill, you want to get John 1 13. Whoever has, uh, whoever has been born of God does not sin. For his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin, because he has been born of God. Okay, we're not going to discuss what that verse means now. We'll discuss it later. John 1, verse 13. Who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. All right. Born of God, again, this idea of being born of God. Paul will use that language a little bit. But John especially, you must be born again. The phrase is, uh, is bandied about all over uh, uh, those who profess to be Christians today. But it's only found in John 3. You must be born again. My dad used to say when someone claimed to be a born-again Christian, he asked them, is there any other type of Christian but someone who has been born again? John is the one who usually talks about being born again. Uh, we're coming to Tammy, 1 John 3, 14, Naomi, John 5, 24. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. All right. So we have the phrase here, pass from death to life. That's a phrase you don't often hear in the New Testament either. John 5, verse 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. 
He did not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. All right, now John is not the one speaking there. If you have a red letter Bible, you'll notice that it's Jesus who's speaking there. But as an apostle of Jesus Christ, you pick up his vocabulary too. And someone, someone who has grown up listening to someone's preaching, myself included, picked up, I picked up a lot of my dad's phraseology because he was the only one I grew up listening to. He was the only preacher of the congregation which I attended before here. It's not that I didn't hear any other preacher, but he was the one I pre heard the most. And so I borrow things from how he spoke. John was with Jesus for three years. Listen to him preach, I don't know how many sermons. Listen to him teach in private all of the time. Here's the phrase, pass from death to life. Again, one of, not one of those phrases you see a lot in the New Testament. Even though the idea is. Paul says in Romans chapter 6, we have been, we have died to sin. We have been raised to walk in newness of life. Same idea, passing from death to life. But it's not said the same way. Uh, let's get Henry, 1 John 4, verse 6, and Bill, John 14, 17. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who, he who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. And John 14, 17. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. Who is the spirit of truth? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. When Paul speaks of the Holy Spirit, how does he usually refer to him? There's a couple ways. Spirit of God. Spirit of God. A lot of Paul's writing talks about the Spirit of God or the Holy Spirit himself. We, the Spirit of Truth, though, is unique to John. Another, another internal uh, clue is John. Um, uh, as John... Um, um, is the uh is the author we'll go down to the last one uh well though this one will be good john first john 5 verse 6 tammy will get and john 19 34. this is he who came by water and blood jesus christ not only by water but by water and blood and it is the spirit who bears witness because the spirit is true i guess it's the next verse that are the uh it is the verse that, that depending on the version you have, you have an extended verse or a flattened verse. And the flattened verse is more likely the actual reading of that verse. But, uh, so we have water and blood. It comes by water and blood. John 19.34. But when the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came up blood and water. All right. Talking about what happened when Jesus was pierced. Water and blood. We don't often see water and blood mentioned just that way. We're washed in the blood of the Lamb. We talked about that on Sunday. Being washed in the blood of the Lamb. But there are these phrases that are distinctive phrases that are common to all, to both John and 1 John. We didn't go through all of them, but there are many more you can look at on your own time. That gives us an idea we can have, be fairly confident that John the Apostle, not some other John, because John is a, a common name, but John the Apostle wrote this book. The question of when he wrote it, that's open for debate, uh, and I'm really not going to settle that here. Our author, the author of our 
workbook says around 90 AD. John, we know, was the oldest of the apostles living. He was the last of the apostles. There is history of the other apostles dying before that. Peter would have died probably about 25 years earlier than 90 AD. Paul would have died about 25 years earlier. James, we know, died. James, the brother of John, died almost 55 years earlier. Uh, I mean, he died uh, in uh, probably about 40, 45 AD, somewhere in there. And so uh, that would be in Acts chapter 12. And so John, being the oldest of the apostles, I don't know exactly how old people claim him to have lived, but I think it's pretty close to 100 years old, wrote most of his writings much later. John, the Gospel of John, is the only Gospel that doesn't mention the destruction of Jerusalem. The only one. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, both, all three of them, give that prophecy. The conclusion that can be drawn from that is not that it wasn't important to even what John was talking about because you do have uh, some, some judgment issues that you could get from the book of John in the destruction of Jerusalem. But the conclusion that can be drawn is it already had happened. When Matthew, Mark, and Luke were written, it was still in the future. It, Matthew, I don't know how many times in the book of Matthew, this was done to fulfill the prophecy that was spoken of by the prophet saying, but when you read Matthew 24, you don't get that phrase there. This was done to fulfill the prophecy, the, what written in the prophets. It hadn't happened yet. Jerusalem was still standing. It would fall in 70 AD. The epistles may not refer to something like that, but it doesn't refer to temple worship, doesn't refer to priesthood. None of the issues of the Jews and the Gentiles are really mentioned. We're going to be dealing more with the Gnostics in this book. The, the, the Hebrew Jewish question goes all the way through the New Testament. You have three books that are almost completely written dealing with the Hebrew Jewish question. The Hebrew, sorry, the Gentile Jewish question. Can Gentiles be saved the same way as Jews? You don't get that in First John. Seems to be a unity when it comes to that. And not on the Jewish side. A lot of people want to say the book of James was written earlier because James has a lot of Jewishness uh, in it. Refer references to the law of Moses and doesn't seem to be this problem of Jews and Gentiles. So people want to come along and say, well, maybe the book of James was written earlier before, this before Peter preached to Cornelius and while Gentiles were largely being excluded. I don't know whether that is true, but you don't have that problem in the book of John. We're talking about unity in the book of John. Even at the end of, or sorry, the book of 1 John, even at the end of John itself, talk about unity. Jesus' prayer for unity is only found in John. It's not found anywhere else in the gospel. Anything before we continue? Sure. Same gospel, different focus, different purpose. We often see that in our New Testament overviews. What's the purpose of the book? Not every book was written for the same purpose. Doesn't seem to be Jews and Gentiles. Seems to be Christians, children of God. Uh, in uh, uh, in John's writing, so that probably was being more being settled, and the reason it was settled is Jerusalem fell. 
You didn't have the priesthoods, the priesthood in Jerusalem. And it's not that the Jews didn't exist. They still existed. But there wasn't that rivalry. The same type of rivalry. There was. But the same type of rivalry. Because the Jerusalem temple was gone. And it's still gone to this day. Just like the time of the writing, the place of the writing is also speculative. John was associated with the city of Ephesus a lot. We think of Paul being associated with Ephesus, and he was. It was one of the pl longest places Paul stayed. Timothy being associated with the church at Ephesus, and he was. That's where Paul wrote to Timothy in the book of First and Second Timothy. But John was associated with that much later in his life. The church at Ephesus is referred to in the book of Revelation. We know it, is, it still exists. John wasn't with the church at Ephesus when he wrote the book of Revelation. But he knew them. Uh, he knew them. So it is most likely if, if the 90 AD time period is right that we'd be in Ephesus. But there is nothing in the book that's going to um, lead us to that conclusion. And it's really not that important. Because it's not directed to a church. It's directed to Christians in general. And that's important that we realize it's directed to Christians. Children of God. So, Bill had said a couple of minutes ago, why did John write the book? What are some reasons from our notes that we see as to why John wrote the book? Sure. This, and I guess 18 too, but 19, as John said, uh, they went out from us. So, so some that were in that group of Christians bailed out, left. Um, their, their faith had left them um, because they, as we see elsewhere, um, there's, there's just prevailing error. Okay. Oh, we're going to see the Antichrist in, in the book of 1 John. Well, the Antichrist is only mentioned in 1 John. People often associate him with the beast in Revelation and say, well, that's the Antichrist. In reality, there are many Antichrists. John says so here in 1 John. Antichrist simply means against Christ. It's not some special person that's going to usher in the end times. It is someone who is against Christ. And in this case, we deal, there are certain people that are against Christ. So there is internal opposition to Christ, and there are false teachers. And the people who John is writing to needed to know that there are false teachers. Test the spirits to see whether they are of God. In Acts 17, verse 11, the, noble, the Bereans were no, more noble than those in Thessalonica because they searched the scriptures daily to see if those things were so, the things that Paul wrote. That should be the what a Christian does. Not everybody who stands up and says, I believe in Christ, tells the truth. All we got to do is turn the television to the religious station to know that's true. You can have one half hour where the preacher preaches one topic, and if you get another preacher on the next half hour preach on the same topic, you can get two completely different... I'm not talking about different sermons. I'm talking about different pictures of Jesus. I was listening the other day to... Uh, oh, I forget. I think it was one of their major ones on the radio when I was going out to uh, get my tire fixed. And he was making a point about, oh, who was it? Was it Zacchaeus or the publican and the Pharisee? I forget which one. It's both, both of the same thing. And he was making a point about how we cannot earn our salvation, which is true. 
And, but at the same time, he was almost making the point that there is nothing we can do in order to be saved. And that's wrong. That's absolutely wrong. The scriptures do say, what must I do to be saved? The answer from Peter wasn't nothing. It was repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. When it comes to salvation, there are many false prophets out in the world. Many, many, many. We have to know what the word of God says. We need to test the spirits. So one of the reasons that 1 John was written was because there were false teachers and their false teaching needed to be exposed that it wasn't from the apostles it wasn't from john it was from somewhere else and they needed to know how to combat that any comments before we close that was the first bell if not then we'll take up with uh more of the introduction next week. More of the conditions. We'll look at Gnosticism a little bit. We'll look more about that when we actually get into the book. But we're going to take a look at uh, what this philosophy was. It was strange the last time we looked at it. It'll still be strange. And, um, uh, and uh, we discussed it, I think, when we talked about Jesus being the Son of Man and the Son of God. And... So we'll see that throughout the book being combated as well. We'll get a little bit more into the purpose of the writing and some of the other things that uh, John speaks of. Before we get into the text itself, you'll notice if you actually get to the chapters, the introduction's written a lot like a sermon. The chapters are not. The chapters just give a very short paragraph summary of what those verses are talking about. And a lot of questions that goes along with it that will lead to more discussion. Hopefully less of me speaking, but I need my class to actually comment if I'm going to get more discussion. There's only four of you. But, uh, but uh, so we'll do a little bit of reading. We'll discuss what the verses are saying. And then we'll answer the questions that go along with it. So it is a little different from the way this man usually writes his material, which is a lot more exposition and then review questions at the end. He doesn't do that in this book. I'm not ashamed to own my Lord, nor to defend his cause. Maintain the honors of his word, the 